Good evening, everyone. At this time, I'd like to call the Wilmington Board of Selectmen meeting of March 9, 2015 to order at 7.06. I do apologize to the audience and those watching at home that we are running a few minutes late this evening. All members are present. Before we start uh, the meeting uh, with the transmitting of the Treasury warrants, I would like to kindly ask that we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'd also kindly ask that Selectman Michael Newhouse lead the pledge. Thank you. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to start with the transmitting of the Treasury Warrants 36, 36A, 37, 37A. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion's been made. Do I have a second? second? Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to our first appointment, which was due to start at 7. Once again, we do apologize for the delay. It is a public hearing regarding the acceptance of streets at town meeting regarding Lieutenant Buck Drive. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the manager. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I would just note that uh, Paula Looney, the uh, town engineer, uh, recommended via a memo back in October of uh, 2014 uh, that the board, the planning board, initiate the process for acceptance of uh, Lieutenant Buck Drive. Uh, the planning board, uh, by a vote taken at their November 12th meeting, uh, did make a recommendation that the selectmen um, initiate the layout of the roadway and. Uh, they also signed the Mylar uh, map for that uh, subdivision roadway. Uh, so this evening, um, just looking for the board to uh, consider any comments through the public hearing process, uh, then close the hearing and entertain a motion to lay out the full length of Lieutenant Buck Drive uh, and recommend that the roadway be accepted by the voters at the May 2nd, 2015 uh, annual town meeting and then endorse the plan uh, by signing off on the Mylar. Okay. I'm at this time going to turn it over to the board for any questions or comments and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience as it is a public hearing to see if anyone's here to speak on this matter and then at that point I'd entertain a motion. Any questions or comments from any board members? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Is anyone here in the audience here to speak on this as a public hearing matter? Yes, if you can please identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, my name is uh, Kevin McDonald. I just have a few questions and a few comments. Um, relative to the uh, performance bond and the guarantee, um, can you tell us um, the bank that um, was um, behind that, if there was one? Uh, I don't have that information this evening, no. I'll have to follow up on that. Um, I think that's a pretty significant issue, isn't it, Mr. Powell? Uh, the work is... I'm kind of curious uh, why you wouldn't know uh, who put up the, the bond to ensure the performance of the uh, road completion. Uh, because the road work has been done in accordance with the requirements. Uh, it has been reviewed by the town engineer. It's been accepted by the town engineer, so the work has been deemed complete. And has the money been, been released? I do not believe it has. It's pending uh, this, but uh, I, I don't know for certain. So I'm just, I guess um, the other question I had was, uh, by any chance could it have been a bank that the town has its funds deposited in, Mr. Hull? He indicated that it's not aware <coughs> of who the bank is and doesn't have that information. We're happy to get that to you, but we don't know the answer. So I don't feel that that question that you just raised could be adequately answered based on the fact that we don't have that information available. It's kind of disappointing that um, that it's not able to be answered here. Um, I guess the other comments that I had, um, I guess it would be probably um, addressed to you, Chairman. Um, people in town, um, they're concerned about their investments. I'm going to interrupt you right there. Uh, but if you keep if you keep your comments relative to your questions and comments, and not speak for other people. But thank you. Yeah, I, I. It's a fairly expensive neighborhood, and I'm pretty sure that the people in that neighborhood um, would like their investments protected. Once again, please do not speak for other residents. Do you specifically, as Kevin McDonald, a resident of the town of Wilmington, have a question or a comment that's pertaining to you and your needs this evening? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this is a public hearing relative to Lieutenant Buck Drive. Correct, but I would prefer if you stay away from other people's opinions who are not here to speak for themselves and ask a direct question about the project. Okay, the direct question is, you're a real estate agent in town, are you not? Yes, I am, but I don't believe that that's relevant to this conversation. Well, it's relative if you're voting and you're on boards that are causing taxes to go up. You might not care about it if you're going to get listings if people please are forced don't out of their houses. Once again, please don't speak for my opinion. That's not what this is about. We're I'm talking not, about I'm an it's acceptance a question, of a street. It's a question directly to you. As a real estate agent, would you profit or benefit from high taxes forcing people to have to move out of their house and move out of town? Kevin, I sit here as a selectman. I don't sit here as a real estate agent. Could it be a conflict of interest? Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Mayor? Yes. Um, s seeing as um, you know, this gentleman, uh, well, I'm sorry, this individual uh, doesn't want to simply accept the parameters of the conversation and insists on widening the scope of it, uh, then I do have a question or a comment. And my comment is that uh, we are here to, ex to review the recommendations of the planning director and the planning board mm -hmm. and to ascertain whether or not the road has been constructed in accordance with the requirements of the planning board. Apparently it has. We're now at that point that we accept the roadway. We bring it before town meeting where the residents will decide whether or not to accept the roadway and then whether or not the, the bond will be released. All these questions about which bank holds a bond is absolutely irrelevant. And I would just ask this individual, when he lost the bond on Treasure Island Road, who was the bank then and did it really matter? It doesn't. You either finish the road or you don't. If you don't finish the road, we take the bond. So, I mean, all of this stuff is, it's, uh, it's, it's way off the, the scope of what we're here to talk about. Thank you. I'm so privileged I'd like to address that last question. Certainly. Um, I put up the, the money myself in the form of cash uh, CDs with the town. The reason why the town took the bond is that the planning board told me that they didn't want the road finished paved until all the houses were built. In the middle of the winter time, when the asphalt plants are closed, they decided to take a vote to pull my bond because the asphalt wasn't finished paved. So you should get your facts straight, Mr. Newhouse, because I personally think that you're also contributing to people possibly being forced out of their houses due to their Okay, I'm going to stop taxes. you right there. I'm going to rule that out of order. Madam Chair? Yes. Just quickly, for the record, I live at 11 Treasury Hill Road. I understand what Mr. Newhouse is saying. And Kevin, as a neighbor, we work with you time and time again. Right. Gave you, we did. Right. And then up in that neighborhood, that cul-de-sac, I had three little kids, one autistic, there was like about a dozen or 15 kids lived in that cul-de-sac, and it was very dangerous for them to be outside the street. Not Kevin, it was. No, it wasn't. Okay. Kevin, it was, and that's all okay. I need to say. All right, we at this time, I'm going to cease any conversation relative to this. I gave you a point of personal privilege. Your questions have been asked, and they've been answered. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Uh, Madam Chair, yes. may I, I see some of my young kids in the audience. I think you're here for the Little League stuff. I just have a quick question for you. Isn't democracy great? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so at this time, would anyone on the board like to make a motion to um, grant the acceptance of streets at town meeting? So moved. Second, lose okay. motion. Motion to the main second. All those in favor? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to our next appointment, which is with Joseph Devlin Esquire regarding public hearing to request the transfer and change of the location of all alcohol license of Tucker's Liquors, LLC, <coughs> doing business as Main Street Liquors, located at 335 Main Street, Unit 1, to Super Target Liquor of Massachusetts, Inc., doing business as Target at 210 Ballad Vale Street. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Please introduce yourselves just for the record and, and welcome here this evening. Thank you. My name is Joe Devlin. I'm an attorney from the Demarcus Law Offices in Lynn, Massachusetts, and I represent <coughs> Super Target Liquor of Massachusetts, Inc. With me is Thomas Leach, who's the store team leader at the Target in Wilmington. He's the treasurer and director of the Applicant Corporation, and he's also the proposed manager of record. If it uh, pleases the chair, I can summarize the transaction before you. Sure. Thank you. Um, we're here for a 
change of location and transfer of the liquor license that's um, at Tucker's Liquors at 335 Main Street. Uh, Paul Nealon, who is the main principal of uh, Tucker's, is also here and joins us in the back. Um, and uh, also with us is Andy Shirelli and uh, Jonathan Kingsley. They're the uh, district leaders for um, uh, this store, which includes this store, and, and Jonathan is, is Andy's counterpart in um, the Asset Protection and Security Department for the district uh, for Target. Um, this store opened in October 2014. Um, they've it, uh, really enjoyed the opening and, 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 and been quite successful and hope that it's reciprocated by the town. Um, you know, Target carries a variety of, of products outside of Massachusetts. Alcohol is a, a product that they carry. Um, out of about 1,700 stores, a little over 1,250 carry alcohol in 37 different states. A um, <clears throat> little bit in Massachusetts, uh, the, a lot of these large retailers didn't ha um, seek alcohol licenses because they were limited to three. That's gone up to five next year, January 1st, it goes up to seven, and then four years after that it goes up to nine. So it, it enables a larger retailer to, to get that um, license and not have a brand confusion within Massachusetts. Because ultimately what Target wants to do is have the Wilmington experience the same as the Denver, Colorado experience. <coughs> um, what Target brings to the table is, you know, the, the square footage of, of the proposed sale area is, is small compared to the overall um, size of the store. Um, but and the inventory is about, uh, the initial inventory is about $70,000 compared to like a liquor store. A well-stocked liquor store will have somewhere between 500000 and a million dollars in inventory. So they're not trying to corner the market here. What they're trying to do is make it convenient for their target, no pun intended, uh, uh, customer, which is Mrs. Devlin, Mrs. Leach, Mrs. Shirelli, um, to be able to get unique um, uh, products at a good price. And uh, they carry about 20 to 25 uh, brands that are exclusive to Target. Mostly it's vineyards or breweries or manufacturers <coughs> saying, we want to try this in a limited run. Where can we get the most reach and, and get some feedback? And so they have an exclusive offer with uh, exclusive deal with, with Target. They grow into larger brands. Um, uh, uh, Modern House Wines and Fancy Pants are, are two that are that are of some renown now that have grown into larger brands. Um, we have <coughs> met with Chief Pagonis and uh, have really appreciated his time and uh, his comments and suggestion, suggestions. Hopefully, uh, we addressed them. Um, and uh, you know, the security here—it's a major retailer they spend more on security probably than you know most of the liquor stores in the North Shore and, and Merrimack Valley area combined um, but uh, you know that's that's you know that's their main goal is the safe service of alcohol just one example is they have a hundred percent carding policy but not only that you have to swipe a card an ID through the point of sale system in order for that alcohol to be rung through. So not only does it have to be uh, an ID has to be presented by every customer every time, it has to swipe and if it doesn't, even if it's, there's something wrong with the magnetic strip, uh, they won't serve to that person because the, the, the point of sale system won't let them do it. Um, all four of us are here to answer any questions you might have. and. Uh, one question that comes to mind just in, in line with your talking of swiping the ID, can you talk about if you have an employee that works for Target that is not of age to handle the purchase of alcohol? They have to check in to their uh, register at the beginning with their specific ID number and if they're uh, under 18, the register won't let alcohol get processed. They're also trained that if someone comes to the aisle to identify it ahead of time and call a manager over to handle the alcohol and, and move the person to a uh, different aisle where, where somebody over uh, 18 and over is there. Okay. Okay. At this time I'll open up to any board members for questions and comments. 
Anything on my right? Um, I see with the police chief's recommendation uh, to us and references recommendations uh, regarding staffing and security measures. I assume that the manager has uh, that for us, or, or am I missing it in my package? Just want to make sure that we incorporate any such recommendations. So, right, that's the. <coughs> I've reviewed the floor plan submitted by the applicant and have made appropriate recommendations regarding additional staffing and security measures to which they have agreed. So is that, um, uh, and maybe I should direct that question through you to the chief. W what are we incorporating if we are to approve this license? What recommendations are you referring to in here that you said you've, you've given to these folks? How do we incorporate that into yeah, it? I set that in a separate cover. The, um, the agreements would be that they would add additional staff yeah. Right now, they have certain uh, staffing for security. They would add additional staff because of that product being in the building. They would change some camera locations. They would put uh, a very prominent signage up um, that there is video surveillance in that area for those uh, different cases, especially for the uh, um, off the front end dial. They would remove things from the end dials and keep them contained in there so that we're trying to prohibit the walkthrough of people that don't need to be in that area. So it would that, be that's specific exactly signage that, that would direct people to stay away unless they were in there for a purpose. Okay. Thank you. So with that, Mike, before you continue on, just um, we were talking specifically about security, but do you want to just run through the recommendations that you received, Jeff, and then I'll turn it back over to you? Yes. Uh, the chief indicates uh, that he's reviewed the application for the transfer of the alcohol, uh, all alcohol uh, package store license from Tucker's Liquor LLC to uh, Super Target Liquors of Massachusetts. We re reviewed the floor plan submitted by the applicant and have made appropriate uh, recommendations regarding additional staffing and security measures uh, to which they have agreed. Uh, and as the chief outlined, there are uh, particular uh, uh, issues that he has discussed with the management at Tucker's. Uh, also, uh, Al Spaulding, building inspector, I have uh, reviewed the above mentioned application, have no outstanding zoning issues. Uh, the health director, Shelley Newhouse, I uh, recommend approval of the application of target for transfer and change of location of the all, all alcohol package to a license of Tucker's Liquor LLC DBA Main Street Liquors to Super Target Liquors of Mass DBA Target 210 Valladale Street. Uh, and those are the cards. Uh, the abutters cards. Yeah. Nope. Yes, those have been submitted. Yes, those are submitted before the meeting. Okay. So uh, have well, we'll just uh, one question I would ask uh, given the recent change in, uh, in law that uh, permits uh, alcoholic, uh, alcohol establishments to open on Sundays uh, beyond the 12 to 5. Uh, there's a provision that uh, provides for opening from 10 to 7. Uh, it's not clear to me as to what the intended hours are on Sunday. If you could just confirm what your Sunday uh, hours would be for sale of alcohol. Your hours are 8 to 9 on Sunday, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So uh, it, there, it would be 10 o'clock to there is no end cap from the state point of view on the the time that you can serve on Sundays. It, it's it doesn't end at seven o'clock. But if the town of Wilmington does have um, a, a requirement that that alcohol sales end at seven, then you know they're going to have to comply with the town's uh, regulations. Uh, we we just comply with the uh, state requirements. So uh, to the extent that it uh, goes beyond the seven o'clock the, the uh, as you know the uh, ability to extend the sale of alcohol on Sundays is something that uh, the applicant would simply notify the board of there is no uh, ability of the licensing authority to uh, necessarily approve or deny that provision but we do have to put the uh, ABCC on notice they, they had anticipated starting at uh, 10 o'clock on Sundays. Okay. It yeah. also blocks it at point of sale as well. You can't, you can't ring it outside the guideline. It's in the system, so you can't. 
Somebody could inadvertently ring it outside of the gui the state guidelines and won't let you. In other words, they punch in the hours, the allowable hours, into the point of sale system, and it doesn't let any product go through um, outside of those hours. Okay. Okay. Yep. I'm just going to stop back with Michael and work work through if that's okay. Uh, I may have another comment, but uh, by all means, any other questions? Okay. Anything here? Yeah. No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I personally don't have a problem with the transfer, and I just want to, obviously, from listening uh, to the information, obviously it's the big super target uh, that's going to have the alcohol license uh, to serve the uh, you know, liquor store. I didn't think it was, obviously, from listening, it wasn't going to be a separate building. It's going to be in the main store, correct? Mm -hmm. And I'm a market basket shop. I always have, always will be. But I did go to Wegmans, and I noticed they serve, or they also distribute alcohol, hot liquor, and beer and wine. And I, if you could educate me for a quick second, I believe the laws are different in Massachusetts as opposed to New Hampshire. What is it? So many supermarkets, so many targets in the Commonwealth are allowed to serve this? Because I know this became an issue, and I remember reading something in the Lowell Sun. And I'm just curious how they're able to do this. I thought maybe only one or two targets or one or two Walmarts in the Commonwealth could actually serve or uh, distribute and sell. Uh, it's actually a popular misconception because of the special supermarket license that came you know was proposed I think around 2006 uh, to give supermarkets the unlimited ability to, se to sell uh, wine so there there are state legislators that legislators that I know that voted on this and still say oh well how is that possible the only thing that's prevented large regional and 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 it affects market basket as well it affects Wegmans it's actually one of the reasons Wegmans came into Massachusetts the only thing that affected it was you could only have three any person firm entity group of people working in concert <coughs> up until a couple of years ago could until 2000 to January 1st 2012 could only have three licenses combined so a place like Target or Walmart or uh, Wegmans, which wasn't here, or Market Basket, or Shaw's, or Stop and Shop, could only have three. And so a, a lot of those companies made the decision. They would come, they'd give me a call, they'd explore, the, they'd, they'd make sure that that was accurate, and that was there was no workaround. And then they would decide, okay, we might carry this throughout the rest of the country, and that is our brand identity. But in Massachusetts, and I've had this explained by like 10 different retailers, <coughs> in Massachusetts, we don't want to just get three. Some did. CVS and uh, Rite Aid. Rite Aid has had three. Um, yeah, they bought Brooks Pharmacy uh, and, and had two, and then they had their own third. But they didn't want to have brand confusion. So they didn't want to have you know the customer in Wilmington, you know, different from the customer in, in Woburn, and being you know where can I get this? Can I get this? Can I? So what I was told was with these this increase in the number that any one entity could have that that now they say okay there's you know 14 targets in Massachusetts if by 2020 nine of them can have alcohol then that's not going to be confusing to the mass customer and ultimately what we really want is the mass customer to be able to go into you know Tucson Arizona super target and find the exact same products in fact it's almost in the exact same place. That, that if, if there's another super target in this area and you go that's selling alcohol, it's gonna be, it's gonna be sold right about in the same spot. So that's, that's actually what has piqued the interest. Um, the Wal there's a Walgreens in downtown crossing in Boston that has alcohol sales now. Um, and, and you know, it's this increase that by 2000 and two, January 1st, 2020, you can have nine. And the thought is that it'll kind of liberalize after that as well. And, and then, you know, the, the Massachusetts will be comfortable with the idea that, you know, not limiting it. So. I appreciate the education. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just curious on that. Thank you. Sure. I have a question that's also kind of educational in nature. I, I have, again, uh, like Mr. McCoy, I have no reason to oppose this. In fact, I've, I'm, I'm likely to uh, to approve. But as long as you're here, uh, is it Mr. Devlin, right? Um, you were talking about uh, how Target is going to approach this, and you want to sort of uh, create a uh, consistency in the Target store in Wilmington that that exists in Minnesota and that will exist in other Target stores. Um, I'm a member 
uh, or a customer of BJ's in Woburn, and they have uh, sort of, I won't call it a cage, but a section uh, for alcohol with a separate cashier. And I think that virtually every BJ's, and I don't know how many there are in Massachusetts, but I think they're somehow getting beyond this three license rule. Do they set up a separate enterprise within the store? Is it a store within a store? Do you they know actually, how? They actually, they uh, lease that space to a separate uh, operator. Okay. And, and I, I don't represent that separate operator, but I know who one of the principals are, and he's got nothing to do with it. He opposed BJ's and said, yeah, B I bet you, and I don't represent BJ's, but at some somewhere they have three and probably five now. The challenge is going from three to five is finding the licenses <coughs> because they didn't increase the quota. They didn't increase, you know, they didn't, a lot of package stores are successful mm -hmm. and, and that's too high of a price point to buy out the entire uh, location. Um, so that and that's, you know, I I don't represent BJ's, but I bet you there are BJ's out there and Costco's out there that have it integrated up to three or five, or they're on the search for the other two. But I, I do know that the ones that are separately registered are, are uh, owned by a different entity. Makes sense. I understand. Uh, and I'll just I'll close by saying, Mr. Nealon, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of sorry that that didn't work out at, at Tarkers, but thank you very much for taking a swing at it to try to keep that open, and we wish you success in your other endeavors. So having heard uh, questions and comments from the board, I do um, recognize that there are representatives here from Tucker's. I certainly, um, you don't have to, but you're certainly welcome to make any comments. I know um, you're good, okay. And obviously this is a public hearing, uh, so if anyone has any questions or comments in the audience before mm -hmm. going to a vote. Yes. Um, it appears as though there are two separate entities. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, how much does a liquor license cost um, to an entity that they have to pay to the town of Wilmington and um, uh, what type of mechanism in terms of financial mechanism is in place so that the taxpayers that are funding a police department um, are alleviated some money in taxes due to um, drunk driving uh, vehicular homicides anything like that associated with um, alcohol. Um, what type of thing is in place so that we, ha the taxpayers, have some type of economic benefit? But I I'll, I'll like to have the question asked as far as how much does a liquor license cost um, for an entity? Uh, Billy, what is the uh, fee? Seventeen fifty is the fee. Seventeen fifty, like. Seventeen hundred and fifty or seventeen dollars and fifty cents, Mr. Hull. Well, what would you guess, <coughs> Mr. Hull? You're the town manager that makes a six-figure salary. I would like to have some answers tonight. The I would think that you would come to the Seven hundred and fifty dollars, Mr. McDonald. And um, just maybe Target could answer this question. Um, does will Target be paying the entity for their liquor, li liquor license? Is that how it works? Choose to respond. Um, Target is purchasing, you know, yes, purchasing the license. So, how many licenses are there um, in Wilmington? There are a total of uh, 22 uh, licenses of various <coughs> sorts. There are five package licenses, uh, all of which are taken. And. Um, how long has this particular license been in effect for, Mr. Hall? Uh, this particular license, um, uh, I don't know, two or three years. I don't know that number offhand. Okay, I, I guess uh, I guess one of the other questions I had is, uh, for example, like Mr. McCoy, just last meeting, I uh, mentioned that he sold his restaurant, but he retained his Mr. liquor no, license. I'm going to stop you right there. We'd just like to get a little education you, like you guys are trying to get. You're on a fishing expedition to try and create a platform. And this, there's, a, there's an exchange between two parties here. You know, we, ha we have a deal here, and we're trying to transfer the license. We've had positive recommendations. We've had board questions. We've had a full presentation. It is clear that you are just arbitrarily trying to pull all of this trivia-type questions oh, out of thin air. No, because... It's not that I haven't come prepared. It's just 
you want to ask several questions just to try and deflect from the business that's at hand to try and put on a show. I'm trying to give you... That's not what we're here to discuss. Tonight's discussion is not about the police budget. That's for town meeting, which we look forward to seeing you there. I believe that you guys discussed um, some collective bargaining, but it's Ms. not... Mr. McDonald, that is not the subject matter. I'm going to rule your comments out of order. I have tried to the best of my ability to be cordial and allow you the opportunity to speak because it's a public hearing. I believe that you are off track and you are off point. Do you have a specific question that cannot be answered? Do you, yes. sir, have come unprepared? Because if you were prepared, you would have gone ahead of time. This agenda has been posted well in advance. And so you want to just pull these random questions and spot people with questions and know that some research needs to be required. If you want to submit your questions in writing, we'd be happy to take that as an information request and respond to it in the time frame that's allotted. It was a pointed question. What type of economic mechanism is in place so that the taxpayers of Wilmington on incurring high costs in taxes to pay for policing for drunk driving issues. That is, not, no, that is not you relevant. Don't, you, don't to have, you don't have a mechanism. Just say no. I don't have anything. I'm not going to say any. I'm not going to answer the question. Because you can't. I'm choosing not to answer the question. I don't believe that it's relevant That's to the subject matter this evening. You you don't come okay, I'm going to bring this conversation to a close. Does anyone else have a comment or a question? Okay. At this time, we're going to close the public hearing. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to grant the transfer of the liquor license as uh, itemized? I'd, I'd make the motion to transfer the uh, liquor license as described by you as chairman and the uh, town manager. Okay. Motion's been made. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good to see you. What is it? Good. Right here. going to give it a brief moment just to change over. <coughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. At this time, we're going to move on to our next appointment, which is with Brian Kane, Vice President, and Hayden Kane of the Wilmington Little League, with reference to the request to conduct a parade on Saturday, yes. April 18, 2015, from the Town Common to the Rotary Park, in conjunction with opening day ceremonies. Welcome this evening, and I appreciate your patience as we are clearly running off schedule. And I do see that you have your trusted advisor and son and yep. a member of the Wilmington Little League to help support you in this request and appreciate you being here and hopefully we can get you home to bed in a reasonable hour so you can get your homework done and have a great day at school tomorrow. So I'll turn it over to you, Brian, yep. to talk about your request and certainly if Hayden has any comments that he would like to make, we certainly would love to hear from you as well. Okay. Well, good evening and, and thanks for having us tonight uh, with a few less people than I had the last time I was here. But um, it's starting to feel a little like baseball weather today, so hopefully we can get the snow melted and have our opening day parade. Um, this will be our seventh year having the parade. Uh, the date we are asking the board for is Saturday, April 18th. If that date is rained out, which we hope not, knock on wood, um, we would like the makeup date to be Sunday, April 19th. Um, one more possible issue contingency. Uh, if we know in advance that the fields will not be ready due to the, the snow we've had this winter, um, that weekend we would ask for the following Sunday, April 26th, if the fields are not ready the weekend of the 18th. Um, Hayden will now give you an overview of what this year's parade will entail. Okay, so this year the parade's going to leave from the 4th of July building at 9.30 and continue down Middlesex Ave to Rotary Park, where we will have our opening day ceremonies, followed by our opening day game between the Orioles and the Tigers. This year, the Kiwanis will also be serving and cooking hot dogs after the game, uh, no, after the ceremonies. 
Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you. Um, and again, we, you know, Wilmington Little League, we really appreciate um, the support of the town, the DPW, the police and fire, and obviously, you know, this board and town manager, I know, you know, just, you've, you're all very supportive, come every year, and you all have ties to the league, which is great, and, um, you know, it should be a, hopefully a great day. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions or conflicts or anything on the time? No, the uh, date's been checked. There's no conflict. And then the other date that was mentioned, do, you, do we still need to check that? Uh, I would uh, confirm, but I, I don't anticipate a problem that, so the following week is election uh, um, on, Saturday. on Saturday, but uh, nothing on the following day, so. Okay. All right, so would anyone like to make a motion to grant the request? I'll make that motion if, if I may. Hey, and you did a wonderful job. That was a great presentation, and you look fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I'll make the motion that we accept Hayden's uh, proposal for the parade. Okay, motion has been made. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Look forward. <coughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. <coughs> okay, 730 appointment board of selectmen to discuss the review of the proposed town meeting warrant. Uh, Madam Chair, as uh, you know, the warrant uh, was <coughs> presented to the board last week. Uh, there are 56 articles uh, on the warrant. Uh, there have been no changes uh, to the uh, warrant itself uh, since the uh, presentation. Uh, I went through each of the articles uh, last week. I don't. Is the board looking to? Review, review them again or what is your pleasure from my standpoint I mean you've gone over them I'm just putting my opinion out there if there are any language changes that you that in other words this read through is if there's anything that's different from the last time we read it I would be interested in just maybe highlighting any of the edits that you made so that we we know the proposed changes if you feel that they're more administrative and um, minor in detail and the sum and substance of the articles are the same but it's just a word change here or there um, that doesn't change the nature of of the Warren article then I'm fine with it I don't know what the pleasure of everyone else is uh, the uh, the one article that was uh, modified uh, to some measure to really be consistent with the town's uh, process for declaration of surplus property article 36 uh, you will recall is the intention uh, to uh, sell the Butters Farm property. Uh, the, the way it was originally uh, drafted, uh, we did modify to, to make it consistent with the uh, articles that we've presented in the past. See if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to sell, convey, otherwise dispose of that certain property and improvements thereto and interest thereon known as Butters Farm located at 165 Chestnut Street in Wilmington identified as Assessor's Map 15, Parcel 13 and more particularly described by the deed recorded at Middlesex Registry of Deeds, Northern District Book uh, 20621, page 233 subject to the preservation restrictions recorded at said Registry Book 20826 page 143 and such other terms, conditions, uh, uh, considerations and conditions and restrictions as the Board of Selectmen deem advisable or take any action, related action. Uh, that was um, other than some minor administrative adjustments to words, that was the only um, change uh, of any consequence to any of the articles. Obviously the petition articles are as they are submitted. Okay. Does anyone need more information than what's been provided this evening, or does everyone on the board feel comfortable with the information you've received? I'm okay now. I look forward to the, uh, the Joint uh, Finance Committee and Planning Board when we can sort of delve in, and I'm sure there'll be opportunity to discuss them in greater detail, but for our purposes tonight, I'm satisfied with what I've read. Okay. Uh, with that being said, let's move on to communications, please. Okay, communications. Uh, the first item is a memorandum uh, to the board 
uh, from me summarizing uh, a meeting that was held with the New England Transrail. Uh, this uh, meeting occurred last week. A uh, number of uh, department personnel attended. Representatives from New England Transrail were Robert Jones III and Ronald Klempner, uh, both managing uh, principals with NET. Uh, we had uh, Mike Woods, Shelley Newhouse, Valerie Gingrich, uh, Dan Deutsch, and Joel Trefello uh, from Geo Insight. I know that Transrail plans to purchase the entire property from Olin and construct a rail to truck uh, transloading operation using approximately 32 acres of the 50 plus acre site. Uh, the rail line on the westerly side of the property is proposed for offloading of commodities in boxcars to tractor trailer trucks. The rail line uh, to the east of the site is proposed uh, for offloading of non-liquid commodities from tanker cars. Items might include plastic pellets and salt magnesium chloride. Uh, while NET did not establish the limits of the commodities they would transport, the representative stated that the solid waste transfer and transfer of oil slash petroleum are off the table, quote. Mr. Klempner stated that they are planning to establish an area to service both their own rail cars and rail cars owned by other parties. Apparently, as a requirement of EPA, most of the activities uh, utilize portions, uh, actively utilize portions of the site would have an impervious surface to guard against groundwater contamination. The area designated for offloading of tanker cars is planned to be impervious and be surrounded by a berm <coughs> intended to contain any potential spill. Uh, the plan also calls for the establishment or the establishing of multiple access points to enable a testing of groundwater or extraction measures in the future if required by EPA. It is expected that 20 to 25 rail cars will come into the site daily, six days per week. Uh, each rail car is expected to contain roughly three and a half truckloads of material. Rail cars uh, could arrive at the site between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. Trucks would arrive at the site between 5.30 a.m. and 6 a.m. to transfer the material and leave the site for their final destination with an estimated two hour, within two hours of Wilmington. Uh, trucks would return and reload for a second delivery with truck operations expected to conclude by about 4 p.m. each day. Uh, using their estimates, uh, it <coughs> appears there would be uh, roughly 90 uh, trucks leaving twice per day or approximately 180 truck trips per day. Uh, Mr. Klempner stated that about 99% of the trucks will seek to access Interstate Route 93 via Eames Street to Woburn Street to Presidential Way to Woburn. <clears throat> Their service areas are businesses north of the Massachusetts Turnpike uh, from Route 495 easterly and southern New Hampshire. Uh, and I provided a, a map of the, uh, the site. New England Transrail is awaiting the final terms being discussed between EPA and the Olin Corporation. It appears that EPA now believes that given the well-documented extent of residual contaminants and the expansive EPA risk assessment that the property uh, is safe for commercial use. Within 30 days of receipt of the notice that resolution has been achieved, NET is expected to refile with the Federal Surface Transportation Board to obtain authorization from the proposed, for the proposed project. If NET refiles with the STB, uh, it is expected that an environmental assessment of the project would be required. There are a number of issues of concern, including the transloading of unspecified range of materials on a Superfund site, the hours of operation and associated noise, the impact of daily trucks six days per week on existing uh, traffic in that area, and the ability of tractor-trailer trucks to safely negotiate the hairpin turn from Eames Street to Woburn Street to access presidential Way and Interstate 93. Can I ask a question on that? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Hall, on page two uh, in the second paragraph, just I, there's a sentence that I, I struggled with when I read this, and then I was hoping that it would become clear when you read it, and it didn't, and it's me. I'm sure it's me, not you. Uh, your second sentence says, it appears that EPA now believes that given the well-documented extent of residual contamination, and the expansive EPA risk assessment that the property is safe for commercial use. So is that, are you suggesting that EPA has somewhere along the line um, uh, either changed or evolved in their thinking about uh, the, the, 
the usefulness or the potential usefulness of the property, even in spite of the fact that it's uh, that it has a, a, a high level of residual contamination from previous uh, owners? Uh, that's my understanding in uh, speaking with uh, uh, Jim DiLorenzo from EPA that uh, based upon the body of knowledge that's de been developed about this uh, property, uh, you know, they, the EPA uh, believes that it's uh, reasonable to allow uh, some measure of commercial use. I think they, uh, and I don't want to certainly speak for EPA, but I think there's, um, you know, th there's some limits in terms of how long they can um, freeze a pe piece of property, so to speak, from being redeveloped. And it appears, again, I don't want to speak for EPA, that they've reached the conclusion that uh, the property can be uh, sold for commercial use. And if I may, thank you for helping me understand that, that terminology or that, that statement. Um, you also mentioned that uh, the gentleman, I forget whose name, doesn't really matter, but they said, um, while NET did not establish the limits of the commodities they would transport, uh, they stated that solid waste transfer and transfer of oil or petroleum are off the table. Do we, the town or DEP or EPA or anybody, have any uh, influence or ability to uh, get that in writing and mandate that that be the case? I mean, if, there, if this happens uh, between two parties, um, you know, I, I really love the idea of being able to have some say over what kind of materials are transporting over our roads and through our town uh, and because I have the same concerns that you articulated very well about that hairpin turn at Eames to Woburn Street and uh, you know the traffic and all the other things so is do you know what to what degree we have influence over with the, the nature of the materials that can go through that was one of the issues that uh, that we tried to ferret out at the uh, meeting is to what degree they uh, had any particular limits they th the response basically was that as a commercial enterprise that anything that you know was uh, permissible they would uh, essentially keep their op options open to the extent that they offered that <laughs> limited um, uh, caveat uh, it, it's uh, that would be something I'd certainly want to have a conversation with town council as to whether or not there's any ability for us to um, you know, mandate that. I, I don't offhand know that there is, uh, you know, but certainly um, from my perspective, one of the concerns is just the fact that there is no, uh, well, there, there's, it's not known specifically over the long haul or even the short term uh, what types of material they'll be bringing in there. Yeah, there's a laundry list of concerns. You've uh, identified them here, but. Uh, uh, I'd love to hear and, and uh, understand council's opinion about our ability to exercise some some controls or some influence over this. So yeah, when when you get more information, certainly I'd be welcome you sharing it with us. Yes, yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. I do agree with the town manager. We need town council involved. I've served on the board for a long period of time, and it's really hard to swallow what I'm hearing, saying that it may be okay for commercial use. I think the bottom line is we want less contamination on that site, not more contamination. And I've seen this trans rail back and forth and back and forth. And I'll say it again, we had people to uh, oppose uh, any construction on that site. At one time, there was a company that wanted to put a beverage dist distribution, soft drinks, you know, recycle soft drinks. And those folks that were opposed to this were opposed to that. I think that would have been a better fit than what EPA is saying right now. But I really find that hard to accept this now after hearing how bad that site was. And once again, we want less contamination, not more contamination on that site. And I believe the residents feel the same way. So I think town council needs to get involved and see wh what avenues that we have to protect our community. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> uh, <I think coughs> Uh, most of what I would have to offer has already been said by my colleagues. Uh, I would just just add to that that um, in my observations, I don't believe that uh, historically, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, I'm not aware of any issue in town that had such uh, unanimous, you know, where, where the entire town was unanimous in its thinking that this facility is not good for the town. I mean, it, it's just nobody disagreed with that. 
and I assume that uh, we all still have that opinion. So we'll we'll do everything we can. Right. So in that direction, what are the next steps, Jeff, in terms of you know working this through from the town side? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are there follow-on meetings? You talked about town council. You know, are you still working to develop a team with your leadership team within town hall, and you'll get back to us? Well, I think the the real issue is uh, looking at what uh, what the town's options are in terms of um, you know pursuing uh, uh, opposing this particular mm -hmm. project, and that remains to be seen. But that'll be something we'll be looking yeah. at. I mean, from my standpoint, I don't want to speak for the other members of the board, but I would I would tend to believe that you know I'm saying it in a different way is that. You know, I'm all for economic development and, and smart economic development, but I feel like this is like taking steps back and it's almost like a regression back to all the work that's been done to try and deal with the old insight that we're, we're almost, you know, going back to the potential drawing board if this doesn't go well. And, you know, I'm also curious too, have, have we received any sort of communication from the city of Woburn, you know, when they've had projects, we've sent memorandums over regarding concerns about truck routes, and it sounds like, you know, we're responsible for 01887, but, you know, 180 truck trips per day that are going to be going down that street, and curious if we've heard any, you know, resident feedback, or if we do get any resident feedback from the town of Wilmington, and if we've heard from our neighbors at all if they've gotten wind of this project? No, I think it's too early. Well, I, I suspect they're simply not aware of it to this point. Um, we'll, we'll certainly, um, you know, be in touch with uh, representatives from Woburn, but to this point, I, as far as I know, they, they aren't aware of it. Okay. Does anyone have anything further? Maybe. Is there merit to the idea, or would there, would it help us to involve people from the state house uh, you know to, to, to lend some influence or convey a message maybe at a little bit higher decibel uh, to EPA uh, well, it, it, like the Congress I mean, I mean, I at the end of the day it's it's really a federal issue and as mm -hmm. was the case previously it, you know, the surface transportation board ultimately is the uh, authority uh, that will sign off on this so to speak so it really uh, I think involve would involve our federal delegation um, and you know obviously we're monitoring the uh, STB website because as soon as this uh, it, it appears that as soon as whatever issues uh, are outstanding between uh, Olin and EPA are addressed then uh, New England Transrail is prepared to go forward thank you Okay. Thank you. Moving on to the next one. Uh, next is the uh, communication with the Massachusetts Municipal Association. Uh, this is with regard to Governor Baker's uh, proposed budget. Uh, his budget is a $38.1 billion uh, 2016 budget. Uh, increase overall expenditures by 3%. Uh, this uh, is in spite of the uh, $1.5 billion structural budget deficit that currently exists at the state. Uh, you know, to the town's uh, fortune and I guess the uh, municipalities and the Commonwealth, uh, the governor's budget does include $34 million, uh, an increase in unrestricted general government aid and $105.3 million uh, in additional assistance for Chapter 70, which is a school aid, uh, the uh, amount of overall amount of unrestricted government aid throughout the Commonwealth would be nine million uh, nine hundred and seventy nine point eight million dollars, uh, and then the um, uh, which would re reflect a, a three point six percent uh, increase. So, from the town's perspective, uh, this is certainly uh, helpful. The net effect to us at this point, and obviously this is the governor's budget, it will uh, invariably be uh, modified or debated, or uh, certainly the House and Senate will have their own versions. But at this point, uh, based upon the governor's budget, the town would receive a, a net increase um, 
of one hundred twelve thousand two hundred and twenty three dollars uh, that's a reflection of the increases through this budget as well as the statutory charges uh, some adjustments there if the governor's budget were to if pass the governor's as budget is. were to pass of course um, you know there's a whole process that goes oh. on between now and um, the end of the fiscal year it's really too early to tell uh, we have correspondence from the uh, alcohol Beverage Control Commission, uh, and this addresses uh, the uh, ability for uh, for uh, establishments that are uh, uh, continuing care retirement communities to have on-premises licenses for the sale uh, and serving of alcohol. So they would be treated as uh, other retail establishments. Uh, they would have to adhere to the same limits that we talked about earlier in terms of the number of licenses in a community so this is just an advisory uh, that this opportunity now exists for uh, continuing care retirement communities uh, next on the correspondence is uh, correspondence from uh, Jill Reddish from uh, Verizon and it just notes that on or after April 16th the following channels will be removed uh, for, uh, Fox College Sports Atlantic Channel 300 uh, Fox College Football uh, uh, Fox College Sports Central Channel 301 and then Fox College Sports Pacific 302 uh, then uh, notes that uh, Verizon will notify subscribers uh, access to Files TV channel lineup is available 24-7 online That is uh, it for correspondence. Okay, moving on to board to consider, please. Uh, the first item under uh, board to consider uh, is a request of Dana Burnham, the president of the Wilmington uh, Farmers Market, uh, for establishment of a farmers market uh, at the uh, Swain Green, uh, beginning Sunday, June fourteenth, uh, <coughs> through. Uh, October 11th of 2015 uh, they're looking to adjust their hours last year they went from 1030 to 130 this year they're looking to go from uh, 10 to 11 10 to 1 I'm sorry 10 to 1 okay any um, any recommendations any town concerns uh, there are no issues there in terms okay. of times would anyone like to make a motion to uh, grant this request? So moved. Motion has been made. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Just uh, two agreements for the board to sign. Moving on to the next board to consider, please. Uh, board to consider uh, closing the warrant and uh, signing the warrant okay we brought that up under uh, communications previously um, or actually one of our appointments um, any questions or comments would anyone like to make a motion to close and sign the warrant so moved motion has been made do we have a second yes okay all those in favor unanimous thank you okay so before we move into public comments, I just wanted to just make a general statement to the board um, as colleagues and to the General Assembly here and to those at home. I believe it was back in 2002, and Mr. McCoy, correct me if I'm wrong, that you um, had instituted public comments, and that was intended for residents to be able to have their selectmen available to them to come in, ask a general question, or if they were stuck on something that they couldn't navigate through, I think the phrase was used, uh, the maze of, of town government. And uh, obviously technology is enhanced. We have a website. We have town hall offers, uh, office hours from you know Monday through Friday uh, during extended periods of time. Um, that to me was the intent for public comments. So I want to open that up. I want to give everyone an opportunity to speak. I'd kindly ask that you keep that in mind. Um, if you can keep your comments limited, your questions limited, and keep them on topic. Um, we'll do our best to try and answer your questions. If we can't, we'll take the information. We'll get the information for you. 
um, like to have the comments to be civil and respectful and I would kindly ask that if anyone were to make comments um, that you please identify yourself and uh, provide your address for the record. So having said that, do we have any public comments? Yes. Kevin McDonald, 140 Andover Street, Wilmington. Um, three basic issues relative to the agenda tonight. Um, first one, Mr. Hull, um, I put in a public record request um, for contracts for the high school or relative to the new high school, one of which was uh, the demolition of the gym. Uh, I got back um, uh, information that Dorenzo um, got the contract for $6 million to knock down the gym. I'd like to get a clarification. Uh, can you tell us um, what the amount is to knock down the old high school? Uh, I don't have that figure in front of me. I don't uh, this evening, but I can certainly find out. Okay. Um, but that $6 million, uh, was that just to knock down the gym, or was that the whole project? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'd have to get back to you. Okay. And um, uh, relative to the uh, uh, Transrail project, everybody in town would like a clean site. Uh, personally, I'd like to see the Olin site completely decontaminated. Um, we don't really know uh, how the Surface Transportation Board is going to act. But if I can just give a hypothetical and um, say, if New England Transrail does get approved, the town will be stuck with that. How can the town benefit from that? And uh, what I'd like to just talk about is um, the last meeting where you discussed um, entering into a 10-year contract to pick up trash. I've talked to several people in town. There's not one single person that I talked to that was not upset with the fact that um, they were switching over to 95-gallon um, trash containers. I personally think that an elderly person who's going to have to bring a full container of trash down a driveway that's, uh, you know, full of snow is, is really very difficult. Um, I think it's probably okay for the city. Um, and uh, to just piggyback on that, um, I don't think it's in the best interest of the town to enter into a 10-year contract. Especially so if we're talking about the Ringland Transrail. Did yes. you have... Is My comments are relative to that. Okay. Okay. I don't think it's in the best interest of the town to enter into a 10-year contract with anybody, okay? Especially if New England Transrail is coming here and we get stuck with them. Because there's the potential where the town could save money bringing its trash to Transrail. If we're stuck with it, okay, which I hope we're not, but if we're stuck with it, why don't we try to see if we can benefit from it by reducing our trash costs? But if you enter into a 10-year contract with somebody, okay, you're gonna you're gonna <coughs> give up that benefit, um, and uh, the other issue is um, uh, I have four articles on the town meeting, one of which is to uh, suspend all funding for the Yentile farm. Um, I was at the engineering office and I got a plan. Um, it was a very simple plan that a high school student on a computer could have drawn. I was told that we paid $31,000 to that company um, for that plan. But then when it came to the contract time for engineering, uh, when I went to the meeting, you folks said that they were not even considered uh, to participate in that. You, you, you really weren't serious about hiring that company. I so don't we appropriated $50,000. What, what you're saying is not accurate, what you just I said was is at not the meeting accurate. And, and basically, Mr. Hull said, um, uh, I think it was Mr. Hall, it could have been somebody else, but said, you know, I think it was Waterfield or something like that, you know, they weren't really seriously considered. Um, no, a, that, that is, what you're saying is, is absolutely not factual information. Okay, well you entered into what, close to a $268,000 contract for engineering, okay? You already spent $31,000. That's not okay? accurate either. The project's uh, kind of a disaster, Judy. Okay. That's your so opinion. the reason why I'm bringing it, yeah, that is my. That's opinion. your opinion. Move on. Okay. Do you have a question? Well, the reason I'm bringing that up is because my article suspends all funding for that project. Right, which you're going to have an opportunity at town meeting to bring that before the town. And, and this so is relative to town meeting time. warrant articles 
which is why my discussion is specifically tailored to your agenda. I'm just okay. letting you know I have an article. Where, where is that? Is two where, where is that? We have it here. We have it here. Yeah, and I just wanted to let you know that, uh, and the people at home know that Essex Agricultural and Technical School You're getting is on building track. two rinks. Where where is that? Because it's relative to my article. Which right, is which you are going to have. You are going to have the joint meeting and the town meeting to bring that up. We're very well aware of your article, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. And I'm, I'm very well aware that this project is appearing to be a tremendous financial disaster. That's your opinion. Well, when you spend thirty-one thousand dollars for a plan at a high school, that's your opinion. Let's move on away. To, let's it's move ridiculous. on to questions and comments. Do you have a question? I'm, I'm all set. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on to new business and committee reports. I'll start to my right. Nothing here. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm good, Madam Chair. I have no committee report. I just want to, uh, you know, we all had the opportunity last Tuesday uh, to be at the grand opening of the high school. And I thought, you know, in the context of really positive uh, investments that the, that the town has made for itself, for its future, uh, last Tuesday was quite special. It was last Tuesday, right? Um, I think it was. <laughs> The weeks kind of blend in after a little while. But anyway, at the grand opening, which was very recent, um, the kids were very excited to go in. You could see their, their zeal, and, and it was such a positive morning. Uh, I had the opportunity, finally, to see uh, the inside of the, the, the space, and it's so very impressive. So um, I just wanted to pay, uh, I guess, tribute to the high school building committee and uh, all the parties that were involved in making that to come to fruition. Uh, the educational staff uh, at the high school and throughout the entire district uh, for uh, getting everything in place in a really short period of time over the course of the week vacation to have that place ready for education and uh, uh, my daughter is there uh, and she continues to tell me uh, when she comes home every evening um, how wonderful the space is in comparison to where they were so uh, again it was just I wanted to just sort of uh, put it on the table and, and recognize all those involved and say thank you but also really just say um, that uh, the town benefited greatly and it was uh, great to be there together with uh, all of you as well so that's all well thank you for bringing that up um, certainly it was a huge epic milestone achievement for the town and um, I think it's you see two or three young faces here in the crowd that really solidifies why I'm sure a lot of us are doing what we're doing and um, that's the positive message the little league parades and those types of things and I think you know comes time for uh, public comments and committee reports and we're I'm feeling like I'm shying away just to kind of move on because there's a negative pulse but there's a lot of positive things um, going on here in town and here's a great example of these three young men uh, with their parents here and then obviously the opening of the of the new school so uh, thank you for being here tonight and uh, thank you for bringing that up Michael because it is uh, certainly uh, a prominent accomplishment for the town so that's all I have on that and let's move on to important dates uh, the next Gentile Farm Development Committee is uh, March 10th, uh, tomorrow evening, 6 p.m. Uh, here in uh, Room 9. Uh, High School Building Committee, uh, Room 9, 6.30 on March 16th. Uh, March 18th is the Finance uh, Committee Planning Board Joint Public Hearing uh, relative to the warrant in the annual town meeting. Uh, town Hall Auditorium, 7 p.m. Uh, March 19th is the a uh, deadline for uh, rookies t-ball registration next meeting of the board of selectmen is march 23rd uh, april 4th is the rabies clinic public buildings uh, noon to two uh, april 4th is the easter egg hunt town common 2 p.m and march 6th is the last day to register to vote at the annual town uh, in the town uh, elections and town meeting a uh, town clerk's office will be open 8 30 a.m to 8 p.m would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, motion's been made. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Good night. Good night.